Hello, welcome to another episode of Forgotten Cemeteries of the Pacific Northwest. Today we're at McBride Cemetery on a very cold and foggy morning. It's located in Carleton, Oregon, Yamhill County. Uh, alternative names is White Cloud, and I guess that's a reference to a public school nearby, which is now a private residence. So let's go meet some of the local residents and uh, hear their story. A little history about McBride Cemetery, um, and it's, <laughs> it's way out there in the country, but as you can hear, it's very quiet. It's a little eerie, and it's a very foggy morning. It's kind of pretty. But we have a pretty early establishment date of 1857, with an estimated 100 to 500 burials per the Oregon Burial Site Guide. It is the site of Thomas and his third wife, Anne McBride's donation land claim. Overall, lacking on the history of the physical cemetery, I couldn't find a, a whole lot on it. I did read that the McBrides came from Kentucky, first settling in Missouri. Then the oldest McBride, Thomas Crawford McBride Sr., came along the Oregon Trail in 1847, so pretty early arrivals. Um, so we have some pretty early birth years as well at the cemetery, and we'll see that. But uh, other than that, just not a whole lot of information, but uh, if you visit the cemetery, it's it's quite the journey. <laughs> you got to come through a closed gate and go down a muddy road and I think it's like I don't know maybe a mile up the road but uh if you're looking to get away from the world uh this is the cemetery for it it's certainly out there but a, a good one so far and as mentioned we are in Carleton Oregon and here's the headstone of Wilson Carl so you wouldn't know it unless you're a local I'm guessing but Wilson here is who um the town's named after I guess this is kind of a debate if it was indeed named after Wilson or a man named John Carl Sr. However, it appears that all roads lead back to Wilson in this debate, and he owned the original post office, a stagecoach stop, and a blacksmith, blacksmith shop. So he's a pretty successful dude overall. Uh, it sounded like he was part of the group that included the famous Joel and Amelia Stewart Knight uh, wagon train. And it appears he witnessed the diary of Amelia Knight, which I believe you can buy the book on Amazon if you're interested. And I'll, I'll try to put a link below. And apparently in one section of her diary, Amelia mentions that she took, she was too sick to cook at times and would have adverse reactions to the dead oxen along the trail. Not sure if she realized it at the time, but she would be in early pregnancy, so that's probably why. Apologies that the camera angle is uh, kind of hard. This is a very tall headstone, and it's a William Ellen McCutcheon, I think is how you say it, senior, born in 1792 in Virginia. He served as a private with Captain John Prayer's Company, 2nd Regiment, Indian, Indiana Volunteer Militia during the War of 1812. I read that he was one of, one of his sons, John, died of typhoid fever along the Oregon Trail in uh, 1866. Also came across some cool information that John, the one that died of typhoid fever, his wife was a distant cousin of President William McKinley. It took me a while, but I did find... Dauphin, Dauphin Hayes, that is a very unique first name. Born in 1848 and joining up with Company B of the 51st Missouri Infantry. One source said he joined up in 1863 and then another said 1865, so I wasn't really sure on the exact date. Um, but if he did indeed join up in 1863, he would have only been 15 years old. Um, we also talked before how Missouri was pretty divided during the Civil War, you know, some people in the state went to the Confederate side, some people went to the Union side, but from my reading, uh, Mr. Hayes here joined up with the Union side. And here we have a McBride, finally. We have Thomas Crawford McBride Sr., born in 1777, Virginia. Almost beat Robert Byrd for uh, earliest birth year of 1776, so close one there. As mentioned, he came to Missouri from Kentucky around 1816. I guess he was one of the first advocates for primitive Christianity in the state of Missouri and spent 30 years there preaching. At the age of 70, he wasn't in the greatest shape, nearly blind, but uh, gave the Oregon Trail a go in 1847, and he brought his faith and teachings with him to Oregon. He would play a part in the or in, uh, Oregon of something called the Restoration Movement, or also known as the Stone Campbell Movement, which was part of the Second Great Awakening. So, got enough names in there? Jeez. <laughs> Basically, it was dedicated to church reform and sought the unification of all Christians in a single body pattern after the Church of the New Testament. This whole thing gets rather complicated, especially for me, because I really don't understand a lot of this. This is all new to me. And I came across this crazy chart of church history and sort of gave me a headache trying to follow it. But feel free to pause the video if you're interested and read the epic flow chart there. 
but Thomas's first wife, Eliza, appears to have died at the young age of 21, and they had five children together. He would marry a second time to a woman named Nancy, and then again to a woman named Anne Wright. Yeah, this one was very difficult to find. A lot of the headstones around here have like this black growth on it or something. But we have William Fraser Jr. here, born in 1843 in Maine, and as you can see, a Civil War veteran. Looking up his record on Ancestry, it appears he was drafted into the 16th Infantry of Maine, and they had a massive list of engagements, including the famous Battle of Gettysburg. I believe I read a stat, too, that more soldiers died in Gettysburg than the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 combined, apparently. Luckily, it appears William survived the war. I found a 1910 census that shows him being employed as a, uh, I think he was the owner of the sawmill, actually. I think he was actually an employer, so he became pretty successful after the Civil War. So, apologies, there's some very massive birds around the cemetery. There's like a body of water too, and they're all squawking. So sorry if you hear that in the background. <laughs> Anyways, we have Private William West here, another Civil War veteran that joined up with Company E of the 38th Wisconsin Infantry at the age of 17. William was actually born in Germany in 1847 and had a pretty shaking upbringing. Uh, his father took his family to America when William was very young. His father was a cabinet maker by trade, and unfortunately, his father died in 1852 when William was only about five years old. Pretty rough youth, but he did get some education and study business from my readings, and then signed up for the Civil War. In 1864, he enlisted in Company E of the 38th Wisconsin Volunteer Infantry, and later on was sent to serve in the ar with the Army of the Potomac. He saw a few battles, Petersburg, Spotsylvania, uh, Appomattox Courthouse, Richmond, and many others from what I read. Uh, more specifically, he fought in the Bloody Battle of the Wilderness, which we talked about in previous videos. Uh, to give you an idea, this bar graph shows uh, the casualties in that one. But post-war, William went on to buy land in Yamhill and started a fruit tree farm and served as a school director and a road supervisor in the area. He was also heavily involved with uh, GAR. And here we have the headstone of Nathan Coons Doc Sitton. Born in 1825 in Missouri and pioneer of 1843, so pretty early arrival. And now that I look at his headstone up close, it does say pioneer of 1843. Uh, he does have Revolutionary War ties as he is the grandson of Jeffrey Sitton, who helped aid the colonies during the war. Did come across a weird story of uh, Nathan here where he was on guard duty in Yamhill County. Uh, unsure why, but maybe it had to do with the Indian Wars during that time and maybe there was a tax going on. But when he was out, you know, on guard duty at night, and he shot what he thought was an Indian approach. And I don't know if he thought it was going to, you know, there was an attack about to take place. But it wasn't an Indian. It was a mule. However, his obituary mentions that the Native Americans and locals knew him as Doc. And his home was quite the local social hotspot for everybody in the neighborhood. And this headstone is in very good shape, and it belongs to Lavina Miller Shelton. Not a whole lot on her relating to Oregon and her story, but she was born in New Haven, Missouri. The town New Haven was originally named Miller's Landing, in which her father, Philip Miller, owned and operated a refueling spot for steamboats along the river. He settled in that area in 1818, so pretty early arrival. However, the town switched the name to New Haven at one point. And uh, you'll also find the final resting place of Philip Miller in that town, who had 21 children after two marriages. So he was a pretty busy guy, apparently. <laughs> and what may be the saddest story in the cemetery belongs to Ward Shelton. He was born in 1878 and died in 1889, so pretty short life. The article was written strangely on what happened, but from what I read, the family was going to church and left the boys behind to ride in another buggy. Uh, Ward's brother, Bert, only 13 at the time, mind you, apparently went into the house and came out with a gun. The hired man, I'm assuming they meant the buggy driver that was supposed to drive him to church along with the parents, said that he should go put the gun back in the house as he may shoot somebody. So I guess he went inside and I guess he got another gun called a Dragoon Revolver. Uh, by the way, I found a picture of this thing. Check it out. It looks pretty nasty. Apparently, the younger brother, Ward, was kind of crying about it, and the older brother said he'd go get the gun, and he'll take out the rounds, because I guess they just wanted to play around with the guns and such. Uh, seems in innocent enough, and he just wanted to please his younger brother. Unfortunately, Bert laid the pistol across his lap, he cocked the gun, and it discharged, and you can guess who was right in the path of the bullet. Little 12-year-old Ward, who was struck in the chest and killed instantly. 
Poor Bert, the brother, was unconsolable for the time, but luckily he went on to live for another 74 years, married a woman, and had four children per uh, find a grave, if that's accurate. What the hell is that thing? And here's George Cruz Robinson. Born in Illinois, came to Oregon in 1853 to Yamhill. I did read it well that he served in the Yakima Indian Wars in 1856 under Captain Alexander Postawade Inky, who was in command of the second company of the Yamhill Volunteers. Captain Alexander was a pretty big name back then, and his name is tied to quite a bit of history when it comes to the city of Portland. He built a theater block and at one time bought uh, Sterling Mines, which has apparently produced millions of dollars in gold profits. Uh, George here was also a member of the Masonic Order of Lafayette. It is my understanding that there's no headstone for William H. Miller, so no picture on Find the Grave mentioned or anything like that. So I figured we'd do our little scenic view of Yamhill Valley here. It's a really pretty cemetery if you come visit. Again, it's out in the country, so it's quite a drive, but got a nice view. Shows him, uh, William, being born in 1844 in disgusting Michigan. Ugh, sorry, I'm an Ohio State fan here, Buckeye. Uh, coincidentally, I think we play each other this Saturday. Uh, so William, he did serve in Company K of the 18th Michigan Infantry under Charles General Charles Doolittle. The company didn't serve in any major battles from my reading, but they did play a part in the defense of Cincinnati, where they kept the Confederates at bay from plundering cities. And if you'd like to know more, check out my video on South Yamhill Cemetery and learn about the famous Cincinnati Black Brigade. And I'll put a little link down in the description. Well, I was excited to show this one to you until I, I found it, and I think this headstone's been vandalized several times, unfortunately. But it belongs to Ellison Cruz, and I believe his wife's on there as well. I think I have the right headstone, though. Um, Ellison was born in 1828 in Indiana, but I was hoping to show you the letters on this headstone, and I think, unfortunately, on the side that's facing down, of course, it should have IWV, which stands for Indian War Veteran. Uh, I haven't seen this in any of my cemetery uh, searches or anything. I just kind of came across it, and I was like, oh, what's that mean? And apparently it's very rare to find on a headstone, so unfortunately we won't be able to see it today. But I think there's a find a grave picture of it, and I'll put it in the video. Um, I'm assuming Ellison fought in the Yakima Indian Wars in 1855, and I just based that on his age. This society obviously doesn't exist anymore, but an interesting find and very difficult history to uh, track down in my searches. I did learn it's not one to be proud of, though, the society um, overall, and did find an excerpt from Wounded Knee from an army medic in FYI. They used the word papoose, which was an American English word for a Native American child. Coincidentally, the Native Americans who do not use this word hate it and find it offensive. So um, reading the excerpt from an army, army medic, he writes, As we did not have much room, we had to load up the dead and put the wounded on top of them. Just as I was looking over the field, I came across a dead squaw and a little papoose who was suckling, sucking on a piece of hardtack. I don't know what hardtack is. I picked up the little papoose and carried it in my arms. A little way further on, I found another dead squad, squaw and another papoose. I picked it up too, and I brought them over near the hospital tent where there were a number of Indian women. As I came over to where they were, I met a big husky sergeant who said, why didn't you smash them up against a tree and kill them? Someday they'll be fighting us. I told him I would rather smash him than those little innocent children. The Indian women were so glad that I saved the papooses that they almost kissed me. But I told them I didn't have time for that. Well, <laughs> I gave my wife a list of people to find and I accidentally wrote Poe instead of Mo. So she's been looking for this um, Primilia and Carrier Poe for like, I don't know, almost 45 minutes and it was actually Mo. so now she's all mad. But oh well, I uh, should go over it. It's kind of funny watching her walk around trying to find it though. Anyways, we have the headstone of Primilia Ann here. This family has a deep history in looking them up. Her husband and more importantly her son who served in the Civil War are not buried here. Her son Perry Mo was born in 1845 in Brookfield, Michigan. Reading up on the uh, father and the husband, James, they tried California at first, but didn't meet their expectations. They moved to Wasco County in 1876, and uh, James, the father, died there in 1884. If you do travel to Star 23 Rebecca Community Cemetery, 
what a name. You'll find that Permelia is on the same headstone, but according to the, uh, the Senate, she's not buried there. She's actually buried right here in Yamhill County. Permelia made her way over the Yamhill at one point and died in 1916. However, their son Perry Moe joined the Union Army at the age of 18 and uh, served in Company F of the 38th Iowa Infantry. He would fight in the Battle of Pittsburgh, but uh, Perry would never return home to his mother. He's listed as dying in Brownsville, Texas. There was a battle there entitled the Battle of Brownsville, and the 38th Infantry is listed as participating in that war, but that battle happened in November. Perry died on December 26, a day after Christmas in 1863, and was originally buried there, but was moved to Alexander Cemetery in Louisiana. So something I forgot to mention too about the history of this cemetery, someone is posting reviews of this uh, cemetery online with false information. They're saying that it's closed, you're not allowed to visit, it's on private property, XYZ, your car will be towed if you visit. None of that's true. I verified it, I called a local funeral home and they said you can absolutely visit, it's open to the public, you can visit. So um, if you see that, don't let it scare you off. Uh, like I said, verified it and they said, oh yeah, go ahead, visit if you will, just be respectful of the normal rules. All right, time for the tour. I highly recommend this cemetery. I don't know if it's just the, the atmosphere for a November day, but it is quite a drive into here. It's not too bad. I have a truck though, so it's kind of easy, but it is kind of a muddy road to get to here. But you should, if you're a cemetery uh, visitor, you love this stuff, highly, highly recommend this cemetery. The atmosphere, I'd, I don't know, give it a 10 out of 10 on atmosphere. Very quiet, just interesting one. A lot of history. This is a pretty unique one. I can't read that. Gib. Interesting first name. A lot of war veterans. Looks pretty active still for the most part. Some new burials. Wow, that's pretty elaborate. It's got the Bible, I'm assuming, there with a cross. For Leslie Lewis Ward, World War II. So you do see a lot of families that we talked about. We talked about you them to see it during the tour. This is a cool one. Horseshoes, cowboy boots, cross grove. Like I said the birds are gigantic around here and they're loud. There. I don't know. I can't see a marker. For the most part, I think the pioneers are kind of towards the center of the road. There's like a little road down the center of the cemetery that you can pull into if you like. I just kind of parked on the outside though. That's a very young death. A couple years old. I don't see any names on there. Well, yeah, maybe. Hard to read, though. I said a lot of them are very wore down. did talk about this individual. If you're interested, I'll stop by real quick. William McCutcheon. I think that's how you say it. But, as you can see, 
very tall headstone. My tripod didn't reach up that far. There is some vandalism here, unfortunately. It seems to be concentrated in this zone, like kind of in the center of the cemetery. And something like this big tomb style of John Wenzenberger. Oh boy. No, I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> Unfortunately, like this whole row got hit. The vandalism, I guess. This one as well. And that's unfortunate. Is that unique name? Dauphin? Dauphin? Uh, I don't know. I'm just gonna give up <laughs> trying to pronounce that. <laughs> well, these ones are pretty. These are really young ones though. Yeah. Seeing the, the little lamb there usually indicates a, a young death. Same with this one. Yeah, they both have the same mother and father. So both of the children died very young. We do have a plate over here. Foreign Wars, yeah. Crap off there. World War II. There's one of those loud birds. Just keep flying over the cemetery every few minutes. One of them sounded really weird. It's like a, I don't know, like gurgling. Like on a drain or something. It was one of the weirdest noises I ever heard from a bird. <laughs> it's just a little guy right here, WLC. All by themselves. It's like the size of a Kindle. It looks like some of these here, but I don't see any writing or anything. No headstone. Like there's a big symbol here, but I cannot make it out. What if it's some type of Masonic symbol? That's wore down. What the heck is that thing? I don't know what that is. Like a baby monitor or something? I don't know. <laughs> that was odd, wasn't it? Let's see, Shelton. The weeping willow tree. Usually indicates an unexpected death or just sadness in general from my reading. Jeez, a lot of children. Pretty nice symbolism. This one's in really good shape of Mary J. And the iconic finger pointing up with the hope to going to heaven upon your death. And we talked about Little Ward here. Probably the saddest story in the whole cemetery. Lavina. I 
we're all pretty happy. I found every one I wanted to. This one's pretty cool with a cross on there. Johnson. It looks like there's a couple individuals on here. I like how their names are like illuminated in a uh, moth. They're pretty <laughs> kind of cool. <laughs> You think for a, such a thick headstone it wouldn't break. Holy crap. And this hunk of rock. I bet she's sitting. Yeah, this seems to be a very popular name in this cemetery of sitting. But check out that behemoth. Very intricate intricate uh carving there, huh? I don't think I've seen that style of headstone before. It's pretty. Random heart right there. Civil War guy, Wes. I think we're way over here. I don't even think I've been over here yet in the cemetery. That's pretty cool. Let me move that. So it's in a pretty quiet area of the Anhill County area. Got a little pond over there. Very quiet. Nice little park bench there too if you want to sit and read a book. Or just get away from the world. that over there. I think it's an angel. I'm not really sure. Yeah, kind of randomly over here in the bushes. I got that view. Wow. A cold, pretty day in Yamhill County. Who I think, I don't know. In my opinion, it's Yamhill versus Clackamas for best cemeteries. As far as like, I don't know, location and history. Those two counties are uh, pretty loaded with it. But, hope you enjoyed McBride Cemetery. It was a good one, and I highly recommend it. If you have any other uh, recommendations for cemeteries to visit in Oregon, or even Southern Washington, feel free to comment below. Hope you liked the video, and uh, stay safe out there. Thanks for watching.